policies Republicans pursued during the War of 1812 impacted the nation's history more than the war itself. The corrupted Republican Party totally embraced statism to expand their empire. Those are the words of Dr. Patrick Newman, who is joining me once again for this episode of Liberty Versus Power. Today's episode dives into the presidency of James Madison. And as we will learn, a lot of that is shaped by the War of 1812. So before we begin, Patrick, how are you doing today? And how should we think about this period of history that we're entering in? You know, after the Jeffersonian administration, we have, uh, uh, you know, these these war drums that are coming in with some expansionist ideas. Where, Where should we be thinking about when we're looking at this particular period? Well, so when we when we're analyzing this period, it's important to remember that the Jeffersonian plan to sort of repeal the Federalist cronyism, try and go back to some sort of system akin to the Articles of Confederation, et cetera, that has that 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 plan has been totally uh, dismissed by now. The Jeffersonian Republicans are very similar to the Federalists in various ways. And now that we're entering in the era of the Madisonian administration, this is kind of this broad sort of moderation. Yeah, there are the, the Federalist Party is, 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 is really just located in New England. It's, it's all but dead. The, the, the moderate Republicans, as well as the war hawks and the invisibles, they're all in favor of, uh, of, of aggressive wars of various kinds. So the cronyism now, at least initially, switches to or focuses, continuing to focus on land expansion in that this war of land expansion for conquest then leads to pretty much a readoption of the whole Federalist program, central banking, protective tariffs, internal improvements during the war, as well as after at the tail end of the Madison administration. So Madison started off as a nationalist. He kind of opportunistically switched switched close to closer to Jefferson uh, during the 1790s. And then he returns full circle to his old nationalist roots. And there really is just this this lust for conquest that really plays out, I think, well in, in your narrative within cronyism, <laughs> liberty versus power in early America. You can get a, a discount in the Mises store by using the promo code LVP. If you do not have yours yet, what are you waiting for? Uh, but one of the things I love is that, again, this is great revisionist narrative, really highlighting that, you know, j- just how central that that lust for taking over Canada really was to to the drumbeats of the War of 1812. I, I know my history textbook, I think most narratives out there tried to, you know, they, they focus on on issues going on with, uh, you know, making sure that the British weren't taking captive of our, our soldiers and things like that, you know, sailors out there in the, the ocean, you know, all, all of the, the consequences of, of their hostilities with France and whatnot. But but really, though, it, it, it is this this aspiration to expand the American empire and and you know you do a great job of highlighting quotes from individuals like you know oh, Chief Warhawk Henry Clay, uh, even Mattis himself. That makes it very clear that you know if they take over Canada, the goal is not to use this as some sort of bargaining chip to get what we really want, which is just to make sure that that we're not going to be molested by the the British mil- navy. That that the, the really go- the goal here really is again to expand the American presence throughout. North America and, and, and Florida and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the problem of the Louisiana Purchase. So the Louisiana Purchase increased the size of the country by about 500 some odd million acres, this enormous acquisition. So the the boundaries of the country have been pushed in that now you have new boundaries. There's sort of this pressure to acquire more territory to strengthen those boundaries. So now that you have a greater presence in the Caribbean, uh, you want to get Florida. Okay. Now that you have a greater presence uh, in in the West, you want to also acquire Canada in the North and strengthen your control of the the Great Lakes region and so on. And this is really a the the ultimate goal of of, of Jefferson in his second administration. He comes very close to actually declaring war on Canada and having like a full scale invasion. Uh, and then this is sort of uh, continued on in the Madison administration. We of course do not conquer Canada, uh, nor do we get all of Florida during that time. Instead, we just get a small amount of Florida. But it's still important to recognize. 
uh, what the War of 1812 really was. It was a war of attempted conquest. It was not sort of a, a war where we're once again standing up to the British as, as, as we were in the American Revolutionary War. We were the aggressors. The British weren't perfect before uh, this time period, but they didn't want war. Uh, we were the aggressors and, you know, we deserve the blame for embarking upon uh, this, this, this war that really just led to a tremendous amount of cronyism. And since we're looking at sort of that cronyist aspect, that economic aspect, uh, can you set up just a little bit, why was Canada so important? It is, yeah, it's so, not just land for the sake of land, but obviously the role of, of rivers, things like that. You know, why, why was Canada such a fixation uh, for, you know, these, these war interests? Yeah, sure. So at this time period, when we're talking about Canada, there's upper and lower Canada. Really, we're just referring to the area around the, or I'm referring to the area around the Great Lakes, sort of above the, uh, above New York, uh, et cetera. Canada wasn't at the time the, the massive country uh, that, you know, extending from coast to coast that it, that it, it, it is now. So Americans wanted Canada uh, for several reasons. One, they wanted controlling Upper and Lower Canada because that would monopolize trade in the Great Lakes region. Okay, this is a this is a a, a point of uh, of contention throughout our relations with Canada throughout our, our whole history. But really, you got to have control of the Great Lakes region. That's very important, particularly uh, Lake um, Erie and Lake Ontario are very important because they connect to the St. Lawrence River and there's a lot of trade that could that you know that could be going on uh, through through there. There's also um, Canada has a lot of grain uh, around this area so a lot of, uh, of of lucrative farmland. It's got a lot of uh, fishing and it also uh, there there's there's various uh, fur uh, trading in in the region around this area. So there are various mercantile and commercial interests that want Canada brought into the United States which is why it's such a, an important target for Jefferson uh, previously, as well as now Madison and the Warhawks to acquire Canada. So let's kind of now look at the kind of the, the inner politics of this dynamic that's brewing. Um, you, you mentioned the Warhawks earlier, again, led by Henry Clay, who is a, an actor who will not be going away anytime soon. Um, you know, so he, along with individuals like uh, Felix Brundy, Peter Border. John C. Calhoun, another one of those guys is going to come up a lot in future episodes. Um, you have the Invisibles, uh, who are have the same similar sort of interest in terms of of you know an aspiration for war with Canada, but they want to go about it a different way. Can can you explain a little bit the differences between these two pro war factions and some of the the, the main characters in, in both? Yeah, sure. So the Warhawks were the, the 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 larger group in Congress around this time period. So you mentioned some figures that would become very prominent later on. So a lot of the famous Americans of the let's just say Jacksonian era, many of them sort of started their career in the War of eighteen twelve. Uh, Andrew Jackson, though he was a senator in the late 1790s, he was a general in the War of 1812. You've got Henry Clay, sort of a young speaker of the House. Uh, you, you, you subsequently will get Daniel Webster. Then you'll get John C. Calhoun, um, Felix Grundy, uh, all these people who would who would be important in, in later era in, in later eras. So the Warhawks were mainly though they were located in the the south and the west as well as a little bit in the uh, interior of the, of the mid atlantic peter b porter uh, of new york who i find a fascinating uh, character he he's 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 um he's an example of this they wanted a war against canada uh, they want, they thought if they get like a quick sort of lightning strike, uh, victory against Canada, just sort of snatch the land. They uh, were willing to say maritime grievances were always the, the main excuse, but that was just what exactly what it was. It was just a, it was just an excuse. It was sort of covering up the fact that they really wanted the, the land in Canada. The invisibles were those, uh, congressmen who wanted a war, but they primarily wanted a naval war. So individuals such as Samuel Smith, uh, he was the the the, the senator, uh, the, the senator, the older brother of um, Secretary of State now Robert Smith, as well as previous Secretary of War. Um, we spoke about them regarding some naval cronyism during Jefferson's mm -hmm. early years, and then you've also got uh, William Branch Giles. I believe he's, he's a congressman. Of, uh, he's, he's he's a senator in Virginia. So they're interested in having a naval war uh, because that's what they think the main battle is, is at. They want greater protection, U.S. protection uh, for their for you know for, for U.S. protection of merchant ships and and so on to protect uh, and to help 
the uh, commerce of the country expand. So they both wanted an aggressive war, but they both kind of differed over how the war would be fought. And that sort of ended up proving to be a, a source of friction. But the most important thing is that they knew that they wanted an aggressive war against Great Britain. Was there a bit of like a generational sort of aspect going on there? Because it seems like Calhoun, it, it, was, it seems like some younger blood uh, on the part of the Warhawks that you know, might be more energized by, by the ideas of like great like land conquest, whether you, you might have a, a more of a, kind of a mercantilist sort of aspect to the naval stuff. Is, is that just... So just coincidental with some of the names involved, or, or was that sort of a dyna- dynamic at all? Do you know? Well, I think the, the 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 younger age definitely matters because they weren't really around in the 1790s and even in the early part of the Jeffersonian era, so they couldn't really see exactly how the Republican Party had changed. Uh, for them, you know, the Revolutionary War was a long time ago. Uh, if they were, you know, they would have been very young at the time, so they would have just thought of it in terms of you know, just a, a patriotic battle, and they, they wanted their own sort of war against Great Britain, et cetera. Um, you, the, the, the age does play a role because this just happened to be a time when you started to see a shift in the composition of the various uh, politicians in Congress, et cetera. So it sets the stage for the later battles, and it just, you know, the pun intended, uh, but it just it, 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 it is important. They were they were younger. They were hungrier. They wanted to make a name for themselves. So that's why they supported cronyism. Yeah, that's one of the things I think is interesting. It's kind of it can be overlooked at times with when we make this transition. And so there, this really is a kind of a different generation of politician that's rising up. Like, you know, the, you, you go particularly from like a, a very written words sort or of dominated, you know, building of, of the foundation there to to a lot more of the oratory, a lot more of the, the kind of the char- charisma in person, mm-hmm. you know, the Daniel Webster's and Henry Clay's and this sort of energy. It, it is th- that dynamic between these sort of generations overlapping here, I, I do think is interesting. Um, so if, if we look at so that, that's the pro-war faction that we also have the, the pushback to this war buildup, um, which includes not only the old Republicans, including our good fan, good friend, John Randolph, who we'll be talking about later. Um, but also the Federalists, who are, I think, just probably what reflexively anti anything the Virginians want to do, and and also the Clinton Clintonians in this in the Republican faction that are, that are more skeptical, is skeptical, right? Is, is there anything else that needs to be kind of understood and kind of what is motivating the, the pushback to this build up towards war? No, those are really the three main anti war groups. You have sort of a smattering of old Republicans that are left. You've got John Randolph. You've got Nathaniel Macon. Albert Gallatin, still Secretary of the Treasury right now, he was sort of always kind of a mix between, you know, the old Republicans and the moderates. But he's he's anti-war at this at at this time period, which is I'm glad my boy Gallatin is redeeming himself after last week's episode. So this is is good. Exactly. Exactly. So he's he he's 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 good on the war question. You have the Clintonians. So this is, uh, of course, uh, George Clinton, um, who was Madison's vice president. Uh, until uh, he died, and then Elbridge Jerry became uh, vice president. Elbridge Jerry, one of the um, people who didn't, who, one of the anti-federalists who didn't sign the constitutional, uh, he didn't sign the U.S. Constitution. He was one of the three members at the Constitutional Convention who did not sign the Constitution. He's also known, of course, for gerrymandering, which is a whole fascinating subject in itself. Um, So the Clintonians were always sort of, uh, you know, they were anti-federalist. They always kind of went at things their own way. And so now DeWitt Clinton, who's the nephew of George Clinton, he was against a war against uh, against Great Britain. And so the election of 1812, which Madison uh, narrowly won, uh, was really almost sort of a, a quasi referendum on the war because war was declared in June and then in November you have this election right in the fall, and then you have the Federalists who are against uh, Republicans anything the Republicans do, but they themselves also did not want a war against Great Britain. They were very close to Great Britain. They thought this was a mistake, and of course it's it's funny because the Federalists, uh, being in New England were sort of the most maritime or mercantile minded right. uh, people. And yet they didn't want to go to war, which kind of shows you at least, OK, then really, is it the maritime grievances that are leading us to war? Um, and <laughs> they, they, they they narrowly we declared war. They, they weren't able to form enough of a sizable opposition. But those are really the the, the main groups, uh, at least the main anti-war groups during this uh, re- Republican hegemony. 
Well, let, let's now go into a little bit of the buildup as well in terms of the, the framing of the war from a congressional authorization sort of standpoint. Um, one of the things I find really interesting is you highlight how uh, uh, the, the language in particular, how the uh, House resolution uh, is, is pushed that would declare within hostilities in this war that the U.S. federal government would protect Canadians' lives, lives, liberty, property, and religion in the same manner as U.S. citizens. That this has very much kind of a feeling today of, you know, the, the, the American CIA talking about the importance of defending democracy abroad and just making sure, you know, we're, we're, we're interested only because we want to make sure these poor individuals, that, that, that their liberty is protected from these, uh, you know, the, this, the, these the British oligarchs. Um, that, that there is a still this, this humanitarian sort of cover <laughs> being yeah. used to justify again, what is a, a blatant uh, attempt to take over Canadian territory. Yeah, it's, it's really humanitarian hubris because a big thing, a, a big reason a lot of war hawks wanted to invade Canada was not only economic reasons, but they just massively uh, underestimated the cost. They thought it'd be really quick and they honestly thought they could just waltz in. Like we would just send uh, American militia and, you know, so some, some land troops and we would take it that the Canadians would want to be released from their British oppressors and, and join the United States. So, yeah, it kind of does have this. We're here. We're Americans now. Like we will we will protect you. You're, you're safe. Right. And of course, you know, you imagine like the whole city's burning and they're like, you're safe now, you know. Uh, and and yeah. And, and so we had pushed for that. The, 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 the war of actual conquest, though, is a major reason ended up basically not succeeding because enough of the invisibles uh, did not side with uh, conquering Canada. And what's fascinating about this is you actually look at um, the big supporters of this, the, the, the South and the West were the war, the war hawks there. And really just the, 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 the relevant senators there were in favor of acquiring Canada at this point. And in fact, it was mainly sort of Northern resistance that didn't want Canada, which is sort of a very fascinating um, uh, the point to bring up, it really shows you how mm -hmm. slavery was not a main factor in this, uh, unlike, you know, pre later sort of conquests and dividing up of territory between the North and the South, et cetera. Uh, but the whole, it, it, it's a fascinating, uh, push. You, you got to give the Warhawks credit. They certainly tried, but mm -hmm. in the end, military inept, uh, you know, just an, an inept action with the, the battles in Canada were disasters and the, the necessary sort of political, uh, legislation just prevented Canada from 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 being uh, annexed or being right. taken into the union. Be my more accurate of a word, right? And then that definitely is an important part. Like, in spite of all of the the failures on the political level on trying to get sort of the the, the big authorization they wanted to for outright conquests, the, the the military practicalities would have restrained it anyway. But it is just interesting that that, that even though there was a, a majority sentiment in favor of the war, again, yet again. There, there was still this kind of playing its interests against each other in terms of some of the, the, the minor politics framing it. Um, I, I think it's also interesting you, you highlight, again, you know, that this is very much we, we see war profiteering play out in, the, in a very early American sort of setting here. Um, you know, there, there's, there's some stuff going on that Robert Morris would be very proud of. Um, uh, can, can you touch, again, going back to our, our friend uh, uh, Chairman Porter, uh, who, who is now yeah. a chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, again, one of those war hawks. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, his, his sort of machinations here uh, of, of you know, making sure that he can, he can profit from any, any potential uh, uh, land acquisitions that come about from this, this matter? Yeah, so Peter Porter is a fascinating figure. Um, he was at least sort of drawing up some initial invasion plan. So he um, had a business, Porter Barton and Company. It was near, uh, basically near Buffalo, so near the the two Great Lakes, Erie and Lake Ontario. He he was very big in getting New York to build a canal to Lake Ontario. So uh, during the internal improvements drive in the eight, in the early eighteen uh, hundreds, which we spoke about. New York was trying to devise, okay, we want to build a canal that will connect the, connect the Hudson River uh, to the western part of the state. So it basically said, okay, are we building a canal to either Lake Erie or Lake Ontario? So if you know your history, you know there's something known as the Erie Canal, which we will, I'm sure we'll get into later. That was the route actually chosen. Uh, uh, Porter wanted a canal to Lake Ontario. So the Lake Ontario is the lake above Lake Erie. The issue, though, is that 
it was decided it would be unprofitable for the state to embark upon such a project because Lake Ontario also empties out into the St. Lawrence River, which Canada controlled. So a lot of traffic would be, would have been diverted away from the canal through Lake Ontario uh, and instead just through traditional uh, Canadian uh, means. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to basically um, conquer uh, – upper and lower Canada. So in order to basically the United States would then block out uh, any like or traffic or disincentivize traffic on the St. Lawrence River in order to increase the profitability and the viability of a canal to Lake Ontario, right? So he would have profited immensely from this uh, if, 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 if this plan sort of bore fruit. I just find it fascinating because it's just a connection of how intricate sort of form policy maneuvers uh, in many ways they can be directly related to sort of commercial interests. So in this case, it was Porter who was okay with in, uh, invading a, a foreign country just to make it so New York would build a canal to the lake that he wanted it to be built to, which I just, I, I just find fascinating. I'm like, why don't we learn about this in, in high school, basically? And so he was one of, the, one of the interests. John Randolph, in his opposition war speeches, was very critical of Porter, uh, with his, uh, because of his connection and how his firm would profit from uh, the, you know, the uh, a conquered Canada. But so it's just a fascinating illustration of how personal cronyism dovetails quite nicely with, say, military cronyism. I wonder if there's something to be said about the nature of some of these these more Western states, particularly Kentucky and Tennessee. I see, but definitely some of the most ambitious men of this era tend to come from Kentucky or Tennessee. <laughs> Uh, that must be a material sort of connection there, the culture yeah, of the frontier. Well, well, well so abs yeah, absolutely. I mean, you would say there is the connection. So one, there was a lot of people from Virginia. You got to imagine Virginia is the biggest state. I mean, it's it's still like a huge state, right? It's Virginia, and it's also West Virginia, right? So West Virginia at this time period is part of Virginia. So Virginia is an enormous state. Virginia, since really Jefferson's presidency or Jefferson and Madison's, um, really, I guess we think Virginia's influence is sort of declining, but that's the people are moving out West people from Virginia. So during this time period, you had Jefferson, Madison, Monroe as presidents from Virginia. You started to see a lot of Virginians go out in the Midwest. So Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Um, then you start to see a lot of Virginians go to Kentucky Tennessee used to be part of North Carolina, so it's sort of part of that. And yeah, it's just the frontier, um, commerce, you know, commerce-minded frontier. It's right all along the Mississippi River, so there's there's a lot of um, interest there. So the country, ge geographically, sort of, it, it, it's the, the influence is slowly shifting, and this happens throughout American history. It's shifting westward. So the new power structures become either the, what's known as the border states, Kentucky or Tennessee, right? Henry Clay from Kentucky, a lot of Jacksonians from Tennessee, as well as the Midwest, which gets populated. So yeah, it's all it's all part of that. Uh, the traditional South along the coast experiences a decline in influence. Why? Because you're getting the rise of Alabama and Mississippi, Texas, Florida, and so on. It's, people are people are moving, and uh, yeah, it's, it's it's related to sort of the political. Um, control in you know who where where the influential people are coming from. So sorry for that that aside. Yeah. I just you know got to go into some old old American history, uh, regional <laughs> history. I guess yeah. that's what we're here for. That's the good yeah. stuff. Because if, if you're looking for a battle for battle breakdown of the War of 1812, please find another podcast. Yeah, uh, because, because we're going to focus on the important stuff now, like such as the the financing of the war. We're going to you know, keep keep diving in the economic issues. At play mm -hmm. because I, I think there's another thing that's that's interesting that you you highlight is that again you know there's there's all this drumbeat for war and, and all these financial benefits that will come if only we can take over that sweet sweet Canadian land but we don't want to pay taxes for it right so so immediately we get to, to <laughs> debt financed military efforts here um, and then even Albert Gallatin who simply talks about the need for tax increases to pay for it he is accused of chilling the war spirit. Uh, by just, just simply for simply saying, hey, look, we're going to have to pay for this one way or another. Uh, uh, can you just touch about a little bit about this dynamic as well? Like we, we now see the Republicans kind of going full bore, again, not only on exp expansionist dreams, but, you know, we, we're going to build up war debt to, in order to do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the issues in, in, in the buildup to the war was that the war hawks and the, the invisibles wanted war, but they didn't want to pay it. So, of course, no one wanted to raise taxes. Another issue you got to you got to realize here that's important is that 1812 is a presidential election year. So Madison's up for re-election as well as some senators and, of course, all of the House of Representatives. So if you're the party in power, you, you never want to raise taxes for an election. You'd rather just defer. And Gallatin, in one way, he's trying to delay the war or discourage it. He's just trying to support tax increases because he knows that it'll be so unpopular. People won't want the taxes, so they won't want the war. So he's trying to actually put the costs up front and make them visible, which I think is a sort of an ingenious plan. But the, the, the Republicans are having nothing of it. And it's basically just agreed that, OK, um, we will raise some tariffs later on. OK, and uh, we're just going to borrow money for this. Right. And so instead, it's just all right, just push the cost uh, onto later generations. Right. And so they they they, they borrow a tremendous amount. They, the federal government borrows a lot. And similar to the war, uh, the, the, the Revolutionary War, who actually buys these right. bonds? It's, 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 it's not always the, the patriotic American. Um, the, the, the real mover and shakers are the wealthy financiers, right? Because they're the ones fronting the capital. They're taking on a tremendous amount of risk, a risk which they're hoping the government will subsequently get rid of, as we'll talk about. So John Jacob Astor and Stephen Gerard, these two prominent um, uh, financiers in the Republican Party, they subscribe to about like a $10 million loan. This uh, loan is they, they get it, it, it sort of a, the, 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 the bonds were risky. They were using depreciated banknotes to pay for it. So they're they're they're, getting, they're buying the basically junk bonds because the government, the United States government is having a hard time selling their securities because the war is not doing good. And of course, what they're going to hope for is they're going to push for another central bank which will increase the price of their debt, right? If that secu if those securities are made exchangeable for bank stock. So we'll probably get into that later, but it just shows you again, the, the once you embark upon this war, that the, you have to ally yourself with sort of crony interests, right? This happens in the American Revolutionary War, happens in the War of 1812. And as we'll talk about later, it happens in the Mexican War. And this of course leads to various privileges. It's benefiting elites. Uh, and so on, and in 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 the the debt financing of of the of the War of eighteen twelve is 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 no different. Yeah, Astor I think is a fascinating character. If I recall correctly, he gets big into opium smuggling. Right, he, he's one of the richest men of this era. I think maybe the the richest. Um, he, he's extremely wealthy. Yeah, he made he made most of his money through fur trading. Right, the opium. Right. Yeah, I think he was involved in that. I have to I have to see. Uh, precisely how much of it was involved in the China trade. I know some New England merchants were involved in that too, as well as still illegally engaging in the slave trade. But Astor makes his money through uh, the fur trade. Um, <laughs> and he also has his hand in, in some in a fair amount of uh, cronyism as well. Yes. And of course, uh, uh, just want, want to, to take a, a small moment to highlight um, – the, the political consequences that are now arising, if you're looking at all of this and you're seeing, hey, look, we, we now have Republican policies directly financing uh, a financial interest in New York, Philadelphia, and, and, and right around D.C. I mean, th this is, you know, the, the embodiment of that the Hamiltonian dream, right? And, and of course, you have our good friend, John Randolph, one of the, the, the sole voices out there really standing against all this. You highlight a great quote from uh, uh, from John. Uh, he, he laments that the party that had once uh, vaulted of paying off the national debt of retrenching useless establishments has yet uh, now become as infatuated with standing armies, loans, taxes, navies, and war as ever were the Essex Junto, the, the, the big wigs of the Federalist Party. What republicanism is this? And as I, I think that's just a, a powerful illustration of exactly what this political party had become. And, you know, and, and then I love that for, for, for his efforts, he gets kicked out of office in 1813. And so like, there really is, you know, take no, you know, no mercy here for that old guard within this moment. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And 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 this is this is it's sort of the final panel. It's it's sort of the the. the it, it shows how much it, it hurts to, to to be criticizing the establishment or the criticizing the administration. So Randolph had already experienced this when he had the split with Jefferson over some of Jefferson's cronyism. And then he was fighting the war of 18. He's fighting the drive to the war. He was trying to prevent war appropriations from taking place, arming you know the military. He was fighting against the declaration. He's fighting against the war during the war. And what happens is he loses office, so he gets kicked out. So he does go back to Congress after the war, particularly the important uh, term after the, uh, after the war when they're trying to establish the Republicans in Madison. They're trying to establish all their uh, peacetime cronyism, so to speak. But yeah, it just, it just shows you it's like, well, uh, sometimes good ideas only go so far when they're lacking other people supporting them and other sorts of important ingredients. But yeah, it's, 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 it's unfortunate. I, I always love that quote. And then I think, oh, wow, he lost office after giving that quote, you know, after saying that quote, like, oh, shows how much, uh, you know, that worked out for him. Um, another important element going on at this time, uh, something that I know uh, Murray Rothbard uh, uh, touches on a great deal with his book on the history of uh, ba- money and banking in the United States. Um, there's a major issue with the way that uh, uh, increase of banknotes within the country through the state banking apparatuses that, that have been you know, become the standard after the fall of the first bank of the United States. Um, can you touch on a little bit of this issue, w- what the traditional spin is of it? Because I know they kind of point to this as an example of, oh, well, here, here's why free banking doesn't work, right? You know, they, they try to use this period as one of those little historical anecdotes against the idea that we can have you know, laissez-faire and money in banking. Um, can you just touch a little bit about this? Because you know, kind of before we get to the the, the big battle over uh, reviving the central bank, what what is it about this system right here um, that is playing out on the monetary side of things? Yeah, so that's a that's a great uh, it's a great question. It's very important to talk about because you, traditionally, when you're taught American history, you're, you're taught that any sort of deregulated banking system that existed uh, in our country's past always led to all sorts of problems. This is the problem of the wildcat bank. So the uh, wildcat bank, where the wildcats roamed, uh, supposedly these fly-by-night operations, they would just set up shop, print a bunch of notes, then they would just sort of skip town. So if you don't have a wise central bank restraining all of this deregulated inflation, so to speak, then you're going to get um, you know sky, uh, skyrocketing money supply, rising prices, blah, 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 blah. So a lot of people, they're going to argue, they say, look, we had the second. We had the first bank of the United States, Hamilton's Bank, from 1791 to 1811. We get rid of the bank, and then during the War of 1812, we see this massive inflation. Inflation right now, just defining as the rise in prices. And then we institute another central bank in 1816. So it's very clear that we got rid of the central bank. The central bank was restraining all of the state banks from in, from from increasing. Uh, credit expansion, and then they all just go willy nilly and increase credit expansion. Uh, this is this is incorrect for, uh, on several counts. One, um, free banking actually does uh, stabilize uh, and limit credit expansion because of competition. The wildcat banks just did simply not exist at the extent uh, people thought they thought they did, or in terms of their their negative effects. The other reason, uh, the the other flaw in this argument is that. The, the central bank didn't restrain the state banks. The central bank aided their credit expansion. And with or without the central bank during the War of 1812, we still would have had inflation because the real reason for the inflation was because the government, um, uh, through, through government privileges to the banking system, through cronyism. One, the government issued treasury notes, which could be used by the banks as reserves, which they used to expand um the money supply and help the Republicans uh, finance the war effort. And the the other issue is is that the, the other sort of privilege is that once the Federalist New England banks started to try and redeem uh, the, the 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 banks, um, you know, banks in the rest of the country, their their liabilities, you you saw the government basically allow them to suspend specie payments, right? Which encouraged further credit expansion. So with the central bank, you would have seen something very similar. The central bank would have monetized a bunch of the government's debt during the war of 1812, and you still would have had a tremendous amount of inflation. 
right? So the, the, the reason why you have inflation during wars, uh, such as the War of 1812, is because the government is increasing the money supply to help finance the war using the hidden tax of inflation, right? Just print the money um, and you'll be able to use that new money first before other people uh, are able to. And of course, when they get the money, prices will rise. So this is a this is something that I was always very influenced by. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, Rothbard's analysis of this um, when he goes in the history of money and banking, uh, explaining this process. And, and I, I, of course, I integrate it into my own analysis of cronyism during this time period because it's very clear that these privileges benefited the banking system, uh, and it wed the banking system closer to the government and almost a sort of a preparation for when the new central bank comes out, uh, the central, the state banks will be able to work with that central bank. Yeah, like that, that, that breaking of, of specie payments, like that, that's, it's so huge, right? Like that, that is, you know, the, the injection of bailing out these financial institutions at the federal level, you know, the, the complete entwinement of, of state privilege, and rewarding irresponsible financial behavior. And again, you know, the, the interesting aspects there, particularly in this scenario more than others, perhaps, that, that you even have that, that regional aspect on display where you have, you know, Federalist banks not wanting to be a part of this effort. And yet, you know, they're the ones that kind of end up getting screwed over the most, uh, you know, because, you know, it, it's, it's their, you know, manufacturing goods being used, being bought up with this, you know, devalued, you know, paper money. And, and you know, they're, they're not getting in return you know, that that hard money that they're supposed to be getting right, like this, this is the start of so many of these episodes that you know have now led to the the financial system we have today. And it's, it's, I think it's such an interesting aspect of all this. Yeah, no, it's 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 a great analysis of yours because the once once the federal and state governments allow the banks to kind of breach contract and suspend specie payment, they they waive their own laws requiring banks to honor. Uh, note and deposit conversion. This just simply sets up the stage for future panics and other sorts of crises where the governments are going to allow banks to suspend specie payments. It's kind of once you do this, once you spare the rod, you, of course, uh, spoil the child because now banks are going to say, all right, well, if enough of us get into trouble, we'll be able to suspend specie payments and there's going to be no sort of um, a legal um, side effects of that. And yeah, so it's 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 important that this happened because it set a very bad precedent. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, so this is all kind of going on within the aftermath of the theater of war. Um, and, you know, the, the military victories are, you know, it, it, this is not a particularly grand moment for the American military. We have the Bernie of Washington, which, you know, is, is, is perhaps a high, historical highlight in some other ways, uh, but not on behalf of the American military. Um, you know, what really is it that drives us to peace? You can, you know, what, what is it? What were the factors that really got us out of this disaster that that greedy war hogs kind of got us into? Yeah. So one, Napoleon, his war in uh, Europe is stopped. Right? He goes uh, similar to Adolf Hitler. Uh, there's the old rule: never wage a land war against Russia. That's what brought both Hitler and Napoleon down. They they wage a land war against Russia. And the issue with Russia is there's just so much land. So you're, you're just not going to win that. So anyway, Napoleon's out. And then this initially looks bad for America because now Britain can basically turn their whole might against us. Uh, but Britain starts to be fatigued by war. Its citizens, its businesses, they've been dealing with high taxes and regulations for the Napoleonic War. They don't want to continue to deal with, uh, deal with this in um, uh, during during this war. So we have a peace commission that goes over to Europe. I believe it's the treaty. They, they signed the Treaty of Ghent between the United States and between uh, Britain. And this is really, I think that we, we just sent like our A squad when it comes to diplomats. And Britain kind of sent like their B squad because everyone else was dealing with like the Napoleonic War. So we basically get a, a, a treaty that says like, all right, we're going to return to the status quo. It's like, all right, we, we got that. There's there's no real discussion of the impressment issue or anything that dies down because of the Napoleonic War. But it just sort of shows you somewhat how irrelevant it was to the, the, the major forces at work. And this is OK. We, we get a um, you know, we get we get this treaty that it's basically we go back to the status quo, which was really a victory for us, considering how much of a disaster this war was. And then you have uh, this great battle of Andrew Jackson yeah 
Uh, he defends New Orleans, and this is seen as a, a smashing victory. We defend against the, the British invaders who wanted to try and capture New Orleans and maybe split the country up or just do something. And this really, uh, this of course happens after the treaty was signed, but just due to uh, communication delays from the technology at the time, we don't know this. Mm -hmm. So we get this treaty, and then around the same time, we hear that Andrew Jackson uh, victoriously defended New Orleans. So this just seems like, oh, well, obviously this was a great victory. Like, you know, we won the war. And no, not really. We didn't win the war. We didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get Canada. We we barely got anything in, in, in Florida. Um, there was no real, like, change in the impressment issue. That just died down simply because Napoleon wasn't a threat. This was just a, a massive uh, government boondoggle that did nothing except increase our debt and lead to a whole bunch of government interventions in the future. Well, it, it did do one other thing. It, it created a new American hero, thanks to that Battle of New Orleans. Like, I, I think it's very interesting that it's just a, a, as a cultural moment within sort of early America. Like, I, I, I think there's, I mean, there's multiple songs that are still. I mean, not that they're they're popular, but I mean, you can still find them on YouTube. Right, the Hunters of Kentucky. You know, there's the, you have you know within that moment of the Battle of New Orleans, the the, the creation of a, a new great man of America. Uh, I've got got right here a a bronze uh, a medal uh, uh, struck at the uh, the pest of, of Congress, recognizing the great victory of General Andrew Jackson. Um, you know, obviously the significance of this and what it has done for the popularity of him will pay off in future episodes, but. Uh, you know, it, it, this was a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, that that just creating a, a national figure, uh, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, but but that's that's it. Right. We're now out of this this war. Um, you, you would think that this entire period would, would perhaps uh, sow some some humility with some of these figures. Uh, the, the guys like like Clay and Calhoun and some of these folks are not going to go any anywhere anytime soon uh, since he has come up already. Can you touch on just a little bit Calhoun? Because he is a very interesting figure here. Obviously, during this episode, he is very much aligned. You know, he, he's making arguments you know, right alongside the, the national Republicans, right? And yet he is then kind of remakes himself as a a, a, a Confederate in in a you know making legal def you know uh, the defenses of secession and kind of plays himself off in a different you know, way. C can you just talk a little bit about where, where someone like a John C. Calhoun is at this period in time, since he, he again, is one of those figures of this era that, that really stands out and there's some interesting different narratives out there with him. Yeah. So John, John C. Calhoun, I, I guess I would say the politician I find him the closest to is James Madison, right? Which means I don't really like him. Uh, my book, it's sort of negative on Calhoun. Uh, for a lot of reasons, people don't necessarily know. I, I think most people who are in fa a fa favor of, uh, like they like Calhoun from a state's rights perspective or something like that, they don't really know the whole story. They also don't really know his whole kind of his positions around things. And even when he was doing a lot of those states' rights uh, arguments, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in particularly in South Carolina with the South Carolina, the, his exposition and protests is during the nullification crisis, he's actually trying to prevent the state from seceding. He's not the most, uh, there, there are more radical people in South Carolina. Calhoun's number one goal throughout his entire career was he wanted to be president. He, he and Clay, they both really wanted to be president. So Calhoun obviously doesn't want South Carolina to secede because then he, he can't be, he can't be president, right? So Calhoun at this time, he is, he is a big nationalist. South Carolina up until the 1820s was a vocal nationalist state. South Carolina was a strongly federalist state during the Hamiltonian era. Okay, a lot of people don't know this. Um, it, it, they, they had it's still an enormous amount of debt, so they benefited from Hamilton's uh, assumption of state debts, and they wanted to use uh, government money to embark upon internal improvements uh, and all sorts of stuff. So Calhoun, he was a very big nationalist. You look at his uh, discuss, his speeches during this time period. He wanted internal improvements, a federal system of internal improvements to bind the country together and to explicitly stop secession. Um, and he also was a broad constructionist. So he's having he's giving arguments. He's saying the Constitution is not like this logical 
uh, document that, you know, we're all supposed to overanalyze, just read it with plain common sense, which I just find hilarious because it's like he does the complete opposite later and you get various other people trying to make all these, you know, the, 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 these hoops, you know, jumping through everything. And, and you see, he's, he's just a big time nationalist. Uh, he wants a central bank. Right. He's okay with protective tariffs. Okay. And he's, he's in favor of a system of federal internal improvement. So he's, he's, he's pretty much on board with Henry Clay on a lot of issues. Okay. As we'll talk about uh, Henry Clay, the American system in the 1820s, but it's, it's, it's similar to Madison in many regards. He starts off as a big nationalist. Then he switches. Uh, he takes some opportunistic shifts. And then at the tail end of his career, he kind of goes back to the nationalist fold, though much less than Madison, just given where he was in the 1840s and 1850s. Well, this does lead us to one of the next great battles, which is over that central bank. Um, you know, Calhoun is one of the, the great champions of putting in place a new central bank. This is after, again, after the War of 1812. Um, but this all goes back to our, our good friend, John Jacob Astor, and some of his, his people that have been able to, to uh, manage to get into as the position of, of Treasury Secretary, replacing Mr. Gallatin, an uh, individual named Alexander Dallas, who becomes a very important ally in their desire to make sure that all of these loans that they have financed on behalf of this war. They want to eliminate all the risk and, and profit the money there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the establishment of this new central bank, at, particularly given the timing of it? Yeah. So th it's after the war and there's this big question that, okay, we know banks suspended specie payments. They're not, we're not on the gold standard. How exactly do we go back? Right? So there's some, there's the old Republican route, which says, well, we just need to contract the currency. Uh, we need to sort of get get rid of all the bloated credit expansion and everything. Uh, then there's other groups that say, really, the National Republicans that say, well, why don't we just charter a new central bank and that they'll, the central bank will help the state banks resume specie payments by providing them loans, right? This is really just a complicated roundabout way of saying we're going to inflate our way out of uh, resuming uh, specie payments, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and it's not intended to. Um, so there's this big push to get a central bank. Uh, well, it's all the wildcat banks. We need to standardize the currency. We need to have one large central bank check all of, uh, of the other all the other banks and just sort of slowly take over the nation's currency, et cetera. These are kind of the political arguments. The The big sort of economic kind of crony motivation was you get Astor and Gerard. They had bought a bunch of government debt during the war, and they wanted to have Congress charter a new central bank where you could acquire ownership, you acquire stock in this bank by exchanging your government securities for the stock. So this would increase the demand for government bonds, which would increase their price, which would lower some of the risk of the investment. So if you bought bonds at a highly depreciated rate, you're now getting the government to increase the value of that debt so you can make a windfall gain. And this is what Astor and Gerard hoped to do, which they, you know, which they um, were able to get through, uh, which they were able to accomplish once Congress did charter the, 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 the central bank. I also just want to note that in, during this time period, the central bank is just one of the policies uh, that John Randolph remarks is out Hamilton. It's like out Hamilton's Alexander Hamilton, which I just find like a really great way of describing it. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we have this new second bank of the United States. It was chartered in 1816. It opens its doors in 1817, and it's just there to provide a bunch of credit to privileged businesses, to state banks, et cetera. So it's just a repeat of Hamilton's bank. And it just shows you how much the Republicans, how far gone the Republicans are. You know, previously fighting the bank was their big criticism of the Federalists. Now they're just chartering their own bank. And just to add insult to injury, then on top of this, we have a whole new level of tariffs and things like that. So we are now seeing, once again, Republican Party engaging in the same sort of protectionist policies, just to round it out on, you know, on nicely. And so again, you know, it, it is now taken between the Jeffersonian administration, the Madison, Madison era, you know, you know, all the remnants that, that, that were there of, you know, the, you know, whatever existed of the old republic. Uh, is gone, dead and buried. You know, John John Randolph is, is out there by, him, by his own 
you know, as, as a lone wolf, you know, just, just being completely disrespected. This is the environment which we are, we, you know, we are now left with uh, uh, 16, uh, yeah, 16 years in. Um, it is interesting, though, that they do finally, though, they, they go one step too far. Um, you highlight there's a congressional attempt to increase their pay uh, that, 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 that backfires spectacularly. Can you just, uh, as, as perhaps a, a moment of humility to all of the goings on in D.C. at this time, can you just touch on that episode? Yeah. So there's one thing you have to understand that people really got upset at back in the day. And this was just something that whenever they tried to do it in um, Congress, people always revolted the next election. And this is why I think we now have a, 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 an amendment that was passed in like the early 90s, long, long after it was announced, like way at the beginning of the country's founding, basically preventing this. Uh, if you're a politician and you want to raise your own pay, don't <laughs> don't raise your own pay for the current congressional session and then sock the taxpayers with the bill. This just seems as like an enormous insult to most people because the public is suffering during the war. There's all these issues. There's all these sacrifices being made. And then sort of in this chaos of the post-war economy, Congress basically votes to increase its pay and then they just present the taxpayers with the bill. So this uh, this this compensation was just seen as enormously egre egregious, and it leads to um, a sig significant uh, a turn, you know, a turnout and a turnover in the elections of 1816 when Monroe is made uh, president. He was pretty much running unopposed at that time period, uh, but a lot of congressmen are kicked out uh, because they had voted for this law. And just as kind of one last kind of Machiavellian gesture on behalf of Madison, um, you highlight how even though he vetoes a bill for internal improvements, that you know that the underpinning here, that the actual justification for the the the, the intent is not quite some sort of last second return to old Republican values, um, but but rather a way of trying to have his cake and eat it too, uh, as he as he kind of exits from the stage here. Uh, yes, because Madison basically wanted um, he, he he wanted an amendment to enable Congress to 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 en engage in this, not as like a restrictive amendment. He just wanted to have uh, Congress basically settle the issue once and for all. He had voted for appropriations for the National Road before. This was kind of him just sort of raising his constitutional scru you know scruples a little bit and just sort of arrogantly saying, well, this isn't as nationalist as I want to do it again. He had previously done that with the bank. He had actually vetoed uh, a bank bill earlier because it was too private. He wanted the government to have more control over it. So this, uh, he, he again, some people have thought this is him making kind of like a laissez-faire stand. Uh, that's not Madison. You got to sort of realize it in its full uh, context here. But this is this is this is Madison uh, just simply saying he wanted more. Uh, cronyism involved, basically. And the election that that leads us with is Monroe, who uh, is, is, is James Monroe versus a man named William Crawford, who's one of those figures that is very interesting in this period of time, often overlooked. Um, is, is there anything from from this early battle that, that people need to know just the, the, within this contest between Crawford and Monroe. Yeah. So by the time of the election of 1816, the Republican Party is basically the only party. The Federalists are more or less dead. Whoever they put up is just going to get slammed at the at, at the polls. They might scrape up some of New England, uh, but that's about it. So really, whoever gets the Republican nomination really wins the presidency. Uh, so at this time, things were decided through a congressional caucus, where basically the caucus of congressmen would decide who would get the nominee of their respective party, right, uh, Federalist or, or Republican. So the Republican contest was between the uh, was between James Monroe, a former anti-Federalist who had really just become Madisonian, and William Crawford of Georgia. He was from Virginia. He moved to Georgia. Um, he, in many ways, was sort of the old Republicans uh, hope. He was a small government in certain respects. And so they were kind of hoping that, OK, we could get him. We could uh, secure, you know, maybe have some sort of return to, um, to 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 what we want. Just, you know, he, he, he's our best option. Uh, there's a couple issues. 
um, with, with this one, William Crawford basically says he's going to run, says he's not going to run. Uh, then he basically agrees to let Monroe become the nominee with the expectation that eight years from now, he'll be the chosen one. You don't never r- run your life off of promises. This is always a big issue. Another important point. I don't talk about this in my book. This is one of the things that got cut. So I find this whole thing fascinating. So William Crawford was Secretary of War at this time, and right before the caucus, he announced uh, some sort of policy. He announced the policy with how to best deal with the the Indian question in the Southwest at this time period. You know, the Southwest, Western Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, parts of Tennessee, you know, around this part. So he said we were getting these issues. Uh, we're, we're getting these problems where settlers are getting into fights with, uh, with with Indians over land ownership and all of this stuff. That's a fascinating story. So William Crawford's solution is he said, well, um, he takes a very like progressive so- response. He says we should just engage in interracial marriage. Like that's the way we resolve these conflicts. We'll just, we'll just marry. We'll just marry the Indians. And his his rationale is is really funny because he says, look, we're already letting in all of these immigrants from Europe. He's referring to Irish people. So he's like, we're, we're marrying the Irish. We might as well marry the <laughs> Indians, right? Like that's the, the solution. And Crawford has this, this proposal that like just mortifies people in Virginia. They're like, what? So that was one reason why at uh, the tail end, he basically did not get the nominee in, in, the, in the caucus was he sort of sabotages himself with this perfectly reasonable plan uh, that's just like it's just it's it's just way too far ahead for the year 1816. Uh, but yeah, there's no Crawford, and then we get stuck with Monroe, which is kind of unfortunate. But I, I, I I've always been a Crawford fan. Um, I, I I like him. He's he's a good guy, and we'll we'll talk more about him in the election of 1824. Yes. Because who else liked him? Our, our good friend Martin Van Buren. Good friend Mar- Martin Martin Van yes. Buren. Stay yeah. tuned. Yeah. So with that being said, we have now made it through the Madison administration. And if you do not hate Jimmy Madison yet, well, then you need to just do further reading that you can get in cronyism, Liberty versus Power in America, 1607, 1849. Again, there is a nice coupon code in the Mises store using LVP. It will get you savings on that. Um, but until next time, if you have been enjoying the content here on Liberty versus Power, please rate, review, share, all that good stuff on all major platforms. For Patrick Newman, this has been Tho Bishop. Thank you for joining us. Wow, oh, geez. Oh, oh. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, what are you, what are you saying? <laughs>